It worked. Welcome to, it may not look like it, but welcome to Christ College. <laughs> to what is, and again it doesn't look like it, the annual Ferry Lecture. And tonight is the Ferry Lecture with a bit of a difference. So we are having a jazz homily, whatever that is, and we'll, we'll find out as time goes on. Tonight's lecture is titled, Improvising Church, Scripture as the Source of Harmony, Rhythm and Soul. My name is Ian Smith. I'm the principal here at what is normally a theological college. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. Just a couple of things before we get underway. Firstly, if the place starts to burn down, we have to go over there. So just follow the instructions. Secondly, if you need the bathrooms, go out here, turn to the left. It's pretty obvious. We're going to be running tonight with an intermission. And so if you haven't got some drinks or something, it looks like most of you have, feel free to bring them to your table. We're going to have a break in the middle of the night uh, for about 20 minutes or so. There will be stations set up out here, back there. It'll be pretty obvious. Go and grab something to eat. Go and grab something to drink. Bring it back to your table. And then we'll get on to the second half. Well, it's uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce, it's hard to say this, Associate Professor Mark Glanville, a graduate of Christ College. <laughs> and... Uh, There'll be more claps to come. And currently the Associate Professor of Practical Theology at Regent College in Vancouver. Mark married a Canadian, and that's what happens. So prior to, prior to coming to Regent, uh, Mark pastored for 14 years in both Canada and Australia, uh, including many years out at Tregear in the Mount Druid area. And there's some Tregear people here tonight. Good to see you guys here. Um, he's written four books. Uh, one is the title of tonight's talk. So you're actually getting the book in a jazz homily. It's due to come out in February next year. It's called exactly the same as tonight's lecture, Improvising Church, Scripture as the Source of Harmony, Rhythm and Soul. There's also, uh, up the back, I've seen Refuge Reimagined, uh, which is an awesome book, uh, which Mark wrote with his brother, who's also here tonight, who I'll introduce in just a second. And he's written some other books as well, uh, Exodus Society Reshaped and uh, lots of articles and it's wonderful to see in Mark a coming together of good academic understanding and something that I don't understand but I really appreciate the arts and culture and embracing such things so it's wonderful to see that. Uh, Mark's goal is to research, teach and write in a way that nourishes Christian leaders. And so we're looking forward to seeing that tonight with creative reimagining. So before pastoring uh, and before uh, lecturing, you're a jazz pianist, hence tonight. And you studied at the con, and it's wonderful you've come back home just for this week. So it's been a long flight, so it's wonderful you're here. Uh, Mark's going to be on the keys tonight. Uh, that's what you call them in jazz, isn't it? It's not a piano, it's a keys. Okay, and he's joined by Luke Glanville, his brother, on the drums. And he's also joined by Peter Kolhoff on the double bass. Guys, we'd like to come up and like to give him a, a really warm welcome. And this never happens except at a jazz homily. Mark's really happy for you to take photos. Right. Yeah. He's really happy for you to take short videos. He's even happy for you to post them. So enjoy the night. Thanks so much for coming. They didn't come to hear me, over to you. Thanks, guys. Let's welcome them again.
goodness, goodness, look at this. Two. It's so good to be here with you all, kind of mind-blowing. So many people who I know well, who I haven't seen for 12 years, some less, some even more. Thank you so much for being here. It's uh, hard to take in and beautiful. Here are the Hodges sitting just here. Amazing, amazing. So grateful for everyone gathering. Thanks so much. Uh, get to be up here with my brother Luke. We haven't seen each other for four years. Saw each other and now playing a gig an hour later. <laughs> which is so lovely. And Pete, our old friend who we've played for so many years with. And I haven't seen Pete in so long. So I feel like for me personally, this is just a night of, of catching up and it's so lovely. I haven't said hello to half of you yet, but I, I'm going to make sure that I do that. I mean, uh, Luke and I, we're catching up. And I was just thinking, we're going to spend the weekend together, but really just playing music together. We're having a conversation. We're having a conversation as we play music. And, you know, I think that I know for both Luke and I, the conversation we have here on the stage with Pete and with you tonight will be the most important catch-up we have. You know, because when you play music, you're having a conversation. You're listening to what the other person is saying, what the other people are saying. You're, you're finishing their thoughts sometimes or, you know, trying to, trying to work out what's going on in their heart as they play and trying to play that back to them. So this is my catch-up with my brother Luke and my friend Pete and with you. So the title for this evening is Improvising Church, Scripture as a Source of Harmony, Rhythm and Soul. And I think what I want to suggest is that, well, the background is that it's in my lifetime, I was born in 73, that culture has seen a shift from what's essentially a Christian society to what's essentially a post-Christian society. Certainly that's the case in Australia and Canada, the two places where I live. And so because of that momentous cultural shift, I believe that with the Bible in our hands, we have to discern what is it that we do as a church that's formed culturally? What is it that's kind of church culture? And with the Bible in our hands, we have to discern what are we called to be and do as a church to hold out the Word of Christ meaningfully in this new, very different cultural context. It's so significant that the church in the West has been at the center of culture since, well, since 323, since Emperor Constantine the First, and it's in our lifetime that the church is marginalized. It's an incredibly, it's an epoch shift for the church that we're witnessing. And so this is the time with the Bible in our hands to discern what is the church, what does the church need to be and do? And I'm going to suggest that that jazz is a really good metaphor for thinking through what the church can be and do. Because as jazz musicians, we improvise on the tradition. And we do the same thing as Christ followers. Jazz musicians, we learn the tradition. We get the jazz musicians in our bones. A jazz musician in Vancouver said to me the other day that an excellent jazz musician has spent 5,000 hours immersed in the music. We tap the rhythms and we get the harmonies in our ears. We learn from the masters for thousands of hours. The three of us have done that. And then each time we come to play, on, play a new performance, as jazz musicians, we're improvising on the tradition. We never leave the tradition, but we're playing fresh melodies, fresh creations in a conversation with one another on the tradition. And I think that's the same with Christ followers. Immersed in the tradition, which is scripture, we learn the tradition, we immerse ourselves in that tradition, the biblical tradition, but then when we come to have our shared life together in Christ in a particular neighborhood, we improvise on that tradition, following the creativity of the biblical authors. And as I'll say, I think the biblical authors were incredibly creative. We improvise, we play fresh melodies in a particular neighborhood as the church on the biblical tradition, holding out the word of life in a way that's suitable for our very new context. The creativity demonstrated in scriptures demands that we don't just re-perform Christian community as, a, as in reading notes off a page, but that we improvise on the tradition. 
One way I think about it is riffing on the biblical story. Hey, Pete is going to show us what I mean by riffing on the biblical story. A riff is a simple kind of jazz motif that we might improvise. And I'm just asking Pete if he might just play a riff for us and then develop that riff for a minute or two. Play a motif and then improvise on that motif. Yeah, Pete Kohlhoff, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We're going to play an old jazz standard for you now called Someday My Prince Will Come. My kids and I, we watched Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the old Disney version, the other day. And this tune comes from that. So I'm a bit addicted to uh, Someday My Prince Will Come right now. And as we do, I hope you can hear us improvising on the tradition. And I'll just quickly explain the way that a jazz performance often works is we'll play the melody to the tune, and you'll recognize that from the Disney cartoon. And then we take it in turns to solo, improvising within the jazz tradition. And then we often return to the melody at the end. And we call the melody the head. Well, let's do it.
Thanks. So when I say that I think we need to improvise on the biblical story, like the backstory to that in my mind is the tremendous creativity of the biblical authors as they held out the word of life in their own day. So for example, my mind goes to the Old Testament motif of covenant. And of course, you and I just grew up with the idea of covenant as a biblical idea, as kind of a theological idea, maybe as you learn at a Christ college. But the idea of a covenant was, was a, a remarkable improvisation. In ancient times, the covenant was, it was a treaty, it was a, a barbaric and militarized treaty that the great kings enforced on subjugated kings. So the king of Israel, say Manasseh, king of Judah, for example, would have been forced to make a covenant with the Neo-Assyrian king, or maybe the Neo-Babylonian king, on pain of absolute destruction. The covenants were militarized and barbaric. And an Israelite scribe had the, well, a bit like a jazz musician, uh, had took a risk and used this metaphor of a covenant, which was really a a tool of international relations, use the idea of a covenant to reveal something about the grace of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Here is, a, here is a God who gives the land instead of taking it. That's an example of, of tremendous creativity on behalf of the biblical authors in Old Testament times. But it's the same in the New Testament. And there's an example after examples. One, I, one example is the peace of Christ, which is a well-known motif in Christian liturgy today. And the peace of Christ is a New Testament motif. And of course, it was an appropriation of, of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, which again in the first century was a piece of imperial propaganda. It was again a militarized piece, a barbaric, brutal kind of peace enforced upon the Roman Empire by the military, by the Caesars. And the New Testament authors and the Christians improvised and they, they started to speak of the peace of Christ. The first time people used that word peace in that way, you know, their friends must have thought they were batty. You can't say that. You can't say that about God. And so the biblical authors have been tremendously creative. And so as we immerse ourselves in the tradition, like jazz musicians, we can follow the path of the biblical authors, follow that pattern, and improvise on that tradition that we've learned today. Of course, I'm not saying that everything changes. With the Bible in our hands, there's a lot of predictability, too, in what the church is and what the church does. When we worship together, for example, there'll, there'll always be the Eucharist. Scripture and preaching will always take, play an important role. There's predictability. I'm not saying that everything's up for grabs. And yet I am saying that playing our part in the biblical story is like a jazz performance. Immersed in the biblical tradition, we play fresh improvisations on the tradition that makes sense in the context in which God has placed us. Well, the first ongoing step is to immerse ourselves in the tradition, to immerse ourselves in the biblical tradition. And of course, that's what students here at Christ College are doing, upstairs in the classrooms, what we've been doing this week in my course and other courses. And it's what we all do as Christ followers, to get the, the music in our bones, so to speak. As jazz musicians, that's exactly what we do. So for myself, as a jazz pianist, this is how it works. We learn from the masters. And so if I'm listening to a, a jazz CD, or Spotify these days, I'll find a little piece, a little bar, a little four bars or a phrase that's amazing that I want to sound like. And then I put it on repeat. The first thing I do is I, I learn to play it. Well, first of all, I study it and work out what's going on harmonically. And then I learn to play it. I get it under my fingers. And then I learn to play that same motif in all 12 keys. And then after that, and all jazz musicians do this, except drummers. <laughs> and you have to learn it in two sticks. <laughs> And then, having learned it in all 12 keys, we, we try and create with it and try and sound like that master musician and get that kind of into the sound. So I'll just show you. Here's, here's a little uh, motif. 
uh, maybe a four-bar phrase that I heard the other day that I got, un got under my fingers. And I'm just trying to illustrate for you what it's like to immerse in the tradition. Oh, there's Paul. Hi, Paul. So anyway, this is a, a wonderful St. Louis jazz master pianist, Peter Martin. And this was his lick that I heard. It's pretty cool, right? And so you got to get on your fingers, you know, and you're immersing in the tradition. And then you've got to play it in all 12 keys. The hardest key is G flat. So I'll give that a shot. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's beautiful, eh? So that's immersing in the tradition. And, 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 and that's the joy, you know, of belonging to a tradition, you know, immersing in the tradition. Anyway, let's play a tune. And we'll show you how we immerse in the tradition. Let's play I've Never Been In Love Before. And I'll see if I can sound a little bit more like Peter Martin than I did before I learned that lick. This is an old jazz standard called I've Never Been In Love Before. Thank you. 
So immersion in the biblical tradition, immersion in the biblical tradition takes the same kind of devoted, intelligent soul work. We get the Bible under our fingers. We become familiar with its characters, with its themes, with its, with its paradoxes, with its structures, with its intricacies, with its theology. And it's complex. We delight. We memorize. We suspend judgment. We rage. Maybe we learn the original languages. And we find companions, maybe new voices, or experts who haven't been given their due in the tradition's historical records to learn from. And, you know, when we play music, when we play jazz together, within a few seconds, good jazz musicians recognize whether or not the music is emerging from within the tradition. And it's the same with scripture. And I think that it's knowing the tradition when it comes to jazz and when it comes to doing church and community, it's knowing a tradition that gives us the capacity to be deeply creative. Yeah, our creativity is inspired by the tradition. We can't be deeply creative, not deeply creative, without being immersed in the tradition. And I think that as we study scripture, we recognize the ingenuity of the biblical authors themselves as they held out the word of life in their own diverse contexts. And so the Bible inspires in us fresh imaginations as we ex re-express a tradition in our particular place. That rich inventiveness of jazz that requires musicians to step into the unknown in trusting interdependence with one another, like we saw with Luke and Pete a second ago, I can inspire us to imagine what fresh and beautiful melodies and rhythms can the biblical tradition birth in us? How can we re-choreograph the sounds, the time, the harmony of scripture in our lives to faithfully display the beauty and tenderness of Jesus within our neighborhood? Only with this kind of poetic imagination can we improvise our part in the story as those who are sent for witness. And just to say too, and we're going to illustrate this now with music, improvising church is a communal activity. Like jazz musicians, we do it together. We improvise out of the biblical tradition together. We play the music together in conversation with one another, one, with one another interdependent on one another. Maybe someone in your church community begins to develop a motif that seems to be spirit-inspired. And this motif may begin to shape the whole performance. And in community with one another, we can go deeper into the tradition. So we'll try and continue to illustrate this interdependence with one another, this communal dimension to improvising on the tradition as we play a well-known old hymn called Before the Throne of God Above.
I'm convinced that the key to unlocking fresh imagination for the church isn't a new strategy, though they come out all the time, but a rich understanding of the biblical story alongside the commitment to em embracing the invitation to improvise on that story. And I believe there's enough creativity and imagination and tenderness in Scripture to last a lifetime. So to illustrate the creative imagination in Scripture, we could go to a thousand places, and I do in my forthcoming book, it comes out in February, <coughs> shameless, shameless plug, no, I'm kidding. But I'd just like to go to one theme tonight, after the break, the maternal nurture, maternal nurture as a theme, a, a biblical theme for improvising church. Maternal nurture as a biblical theme for improvising church. We could go to a hundred different themes, but we'll go to that theme. But before we go to the break, let's go out on a tune. And this is my favorite tune for the evening. It's that old folk tune, There's a Hole in My Bucket, Dear Liza, Dear Liza. You remember that tune? It's amazing. And I love this tune, and it might relate to some of you guys' experience of church. Certainly relates, sometimes my experience of church. You know, it's one of those never-ending songs, right? It's a beautiful melody. There's a, you know how it goes. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Eliza, Eliza. There's a hole in my bucket, dear Eliza, a hole. And then Eliza says, then fix it, dear Henry. Then fix it. Henry says, well, with what shall I fix it? She says, with straw, dear Henry. Uh, but the straw's too long. Then cut it, dear Henry. With what shall I cut it? Uh, yeah, with what shall I cut it? With a knife, dear Henry, but the knife is blunt. Uh, then sharpen it, dear Henry. With what shall I sharpen it, dear Henry? With a stone. But the stone's dry. Then wet it. With what shall I wet it? With water. With what shall I fetch it? With the bucket. But there's a hole in my bucket. Hey, right there. <laughs> we did it. So, you know, that can be sometimes our experience of church, and, and maybe it expresses where evangelicalism is at sometimes, the never-ending story. But as we play this remarkable folk tune and lean into the never-endingness of it, I hope you hear some beauty in the repetition. And if there's any tune that I hope and pray ministers to you tonight, it's this one. It's the beauty in the faithfulness. Because it's hard to be faithful sometimes, but even just that you've turned up tonight. Yeah, it's just a gesture of faithfulness and hope. And there's beauty in that faithfulness that's persevering. And the Spirit can use it.
And we're on a break.
Right, a quick pop quiz. First person to call out the name of the album. Come on. Oh. Hey. Pop quiz number two. Uh, first person to call out the year the album was released. I don't know. Could someone quickly check on your phone? <laughs> you say 93? Three? Five? Five, I'll say five. Okay, put your hand up for 91. Put your hand up for 92. Put your hand up for 93. 94. 95. 96. 97. Let's get some authority. Wiki. Sarah's on it. <laughs> so, that's enough, Marty. Well, we, well, for heaven's sake, how long does it take to find the, the year the Dragon Little Pill was from? 95. Come on. Come on, right there. <laughs> yeah. Luke, what are you doing there? Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Luke. So, uh, improvising church, and I, I want to zero in on, uh, let's try it out with one biblical motif, and let's go with the biblical motif of the maternal nurture of God, which is a theme in both Testaments. So I want to zero in on the theme of maternal nurture, as an experiment, say, of riffing on the biblical story as a motif for improvising church, as a theme for witness. Maternal nurture... As a theme for witness may sound unusual or even unlikely. The idea of offering maternal nurture may sound unfamiliar to you. But when you think about it, anyone can be paternalistic. You know, so maybe in a sense, anyone can offer maternal nurture. And I'm thinking metaphorically. For me, maternal nurture signifies kinship and tenderness, and surely maternal nurture also has an element of, of fierce protection for those that it loves. But all of this needs to land with the church. Could maternal nurture be a motif that shapes the witness of the church? Could it inspire relationships of tenderness and healing within our neighborhood? Maybe fierce protection for vulnerable people in our neighborhood? suppose when you stop and think about it, maternal might be an interesting motive to think about the witness of the church through. Well, the maternal nurture of God is a very, well, it's a prominent motive in the Old Testament. One example would be Psalm 131, which is one of the very short psalms in the Bible. It goes something like, my heart is not lifted up, uh, my, my eyes are not raised too high, I'm not proud. I don't think about things too great or too marvelous for me, but I've stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child is my soul within me, like a weaned child with its mother. Kind of resting in the, in the maternal nurture of God. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psalm of dependence in the maternal nurture of God. God's maternal nurture is also very present in the book of Ruth, which is where I'd like to land for a minute. So let me kind of get you up to speed with the story of Ruth. You remember in the book of Ruth that Ruth is a Moabite woman. And in a nutshell, Elimelech is an Israelite who leaves Israel because of famine and goes to Moab. One of Elimelech's sons marries Ruth, who's a Moabitess. You remember the story. And then all the men die, and it's just... Now, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Ruth, who's a Moabite, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, who's an Israelite. And they go back to the land, to Ephrathah, to, the, to their, the land of their clan, and they try and eke out a living. And when we come to Luke chapter 2, which is where maternal nurture comes in, Ruth is there uh, gleaning behind the barley harvesters, in the field of Boaz. And of course in gleaning, she's just trying to survive, right? She's trying to subsist. She's trying to take enough grain home for her and her mother to eat another meal and survive the week. 
And Boaz is the landowner, and Boaz, who is related to, and Boaz says to Ruth the most remarkable phrase. He says in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, May you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to have refuge. And that phrase, under whose wings you've come to have refuge, is picturing God as a mother bird, which is quite a common image in the Old Testament, as you probably know, the wings of Yahweh. So Yahweh blesses Ruth with this phrase, may you have a full reward from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And I should say, this image of Yahweh's protective wings, the maternal image that in the context evokes belonging, sustenance, and protection for this refugee Moabite. Now, there is more to say about the maternal nurture of Yahweh in Ruth, but I just feel we should pause for a second and play. Um, I have a tell you how I hear in the key of F. If you want to try it, first chord D minor, yeah. First chord D minor, then B flat, then F. One, two, three, D minor. Luke just laughed because I got a note wrong. <laughs> Quick another pop kiss. First person to call out the artist. Nice work. So Yahweh's protective maternal wings, they appear several times in the Old Testament. And almost all of the references to, my, to Yahweh's maternal wings is Yahweh's protection of God's people, Israel. It's God's people, Israel, who are protected in the Psalms, it's God's people, Israel, who find shelter under Yahweh's wings. And here in the book of Ruth, in Ruth 2.12, when Boaz says, may you find shelter under Yahweh's wings to Ruth, it's a Moabites, a foreigner who receives this shelter under Yahweh's wings. And can you see how the biblical scribe is improvising on the tradition? taking this metaphor of sheltering under Yahweh's wings that traditionally is applied to Israel, God's ancient people, to this foreigner, Ruth, to this Moabites, Ruth. So he's improvising on the literary tradition of Yahweh's protective wings. And the wording of Boaz's prayer for Ruth is implying that it's a reliable characteristic of Yahweh to enfold vulnerable immigrants. Yahweh loves to enfold vulnerable immigrants under the divine wings. Boaz says, under whose wings you have come for refuge. The maternal protection of Yahweh. It's such an interesting metaphor. I have a friend who grew up on a farm in Ontario, Canada. He's a pastor and his name's Andrew. And he told me the story of a barn fire that happened on the farm where he grew up. There was a very hot barn fire and he and the family went and opened the doors to the barn after the fire had died down. He walked into the barn and every animal had been killed. There was just tra charred remains of the animals on the barn floor. And he, my friend Andrew walks in and with his boot, he kicked the carcass of a mother hen. And the mother hen's body kind of moved about a foot. And then Andrew saw around 10 yellow chicks scurry away from under their mother's wings. But just think of the fierce, loving protection of that mother hen. Think of the bravery, the incredible strength of will, the self-giving, the strength of that maternal protection. And of course, the ancient Israelites, they were farmers. They knew what they were talking about. And Boaz says to Ruth, this Moabites, may you have a full reward 
from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. These wings are the maternal nurture of Yahweh, the fierce, loving, protective maternal nurture of Yahweh. You know, you may never know the ways that God has protected you today. You know, you may, God has spread out God's wings to protect you, maybe through friends, maybe protection in the spiritual realm. You may never know. In his death on the cross, Jesus defeated death, won a victory over evil, and you may never know the ways in which the power of the cross has protected you today under Yahweh's wings or has protected your neighborhood this week. And in the book of Ruth, Yahweh's protective wings extend to vulnerable immigrants who are seeking the home. God has this loving commitment to people who are on the move, as we see throughout the Old Testament. And I will say, by extension, as Luke and I show in our book, if I may, we can say that Yahweh's protective wings extend to all vulnerable people, whether made vulnerable by immigration, poverty, homelessness, addictions, or something else. The Bible says so again and again. Let me just, let's express this musically. I think uh, there's this beautiful tune by Bach, Yesu, Joy of Man's Desiring, expresses this in folding, this maternal nurture, in the shape of the, the melody, you'll recognize this melody. And hear the enfolding in the shape of the melody itself. You know the melody, right? I mean, have you been to a wedding or have you been to a wedding? <laughs> but it, each note enfolds the next note, so. So it doesn't just go, the, notes in, the goal note is enfolded, then the next goal note is enfolded, and then the whole thing's enfolded. It's really beautiful. The goal note's enfolded twice, and then the whole phrase is enfolded in an arc. It's beautiful. It's like a hug within a hug. It's like you're hugging someone, and then a grizzly bear comes and hugs you both. Because you're in Canada, which is deadly. It's beautiful, it's so intense, right? And the intensity comes from this enfolding. So we're just going to kind of uh, express this beautiful theology, this beautiful revelation of God in this, by playing this Bach song and by attempting to solo it.
Thank you. As the story progresses, Boaz himself is used by God as an instrument of Yahweh's enfolding, as a, an instrument of Yahweh's protection. As you probably know the story where Boaz is on the threshing floor in the evening sleeping after a busy day's work, and Ruth lays down at his feet and says, cover me with your cloak, you're my kinsman, Redeemer, in Ruth 3.9. The Hebrew word for cloak there is the same as the Hebrew word for wings, kanaf, that Boaz used when he was speaking of Ruth, seeking refuge under Yahweh's wings. So Boaz will cover Ruth with his cloak or with his wings, which is the same word that's used for God's maternal nurture. So it, in other words, it's like Boaz becomes a surrogate for God's maternal nurture. It's almost like a double enfolding. God has enfolded Boaz, and now Boaz in turn enfolds Ruth. When Ruth says, spread your cloak over me, using this same word, Ruth is picking up Boaz's own phrase that Boaz blessed Ruth with, and Ruth is as much as saying, you be the answer to your own prayer, Boaz. You want it to me to be blessed by the Lord under the Lord's wings. You be the answer to your own prayer. You be the wings of Yahweh in providing my mother-in-law and me refuge. So it's a double enfolding. Yahweh enfolds Ruth, and Boaz extends Yahweh's kinship and tenderness. So let's think of the possibility of the, the church's maternal nurture. You know, we've seen from the book of Ruth that, that extending maternal nurture to others entails offering tenderness and protection. Of course, Boaz does offer Ruth that enfolding, that protection, that subsistence, and he marries her and offers a place of belonging for Ruth and for Naomi, redeems the family name. There's subsistence there. There's belonging there. There's protection. And, and so the church, I want to offer, should display the tenderness of Christ in similar, by extension, in a similar way. When we think of God's maternal nurture and we think of Boaz extending Yahweh's maternal nurture in the Old Testament, today we can think of the church. And the church, too, can extend and display the maternal nurture of God. And that seems very appropriate in the light that we are Christ's people. The church can extend the tenderness of Christ. Pope Francis, a few years ago, did a TED talk. It was kind of cool seeing the Pope do a TED talk. It was a surprise Pope TED talk. And did anyone see for the Pope's TED talk? It wasn't massive. And the Pope called for, a, it was really beautiful actually, he called for a revolution of tenderness. Isn't that beautiful? The Pope called for a revolution of tenderness. Tenderness entails softening our heart to let other people in, in all their muck and their mess. It entails emotional sensitivity and empathy, slowing down to grieve what Christ grieves, taking time to celebrate what Christ celebrates. Tenderness demands that we extend trust and choose hope. I've noticed in the Gospels that when, Jesus, when people encounter Jesus for the first time, they're often struck by Jesus' tenderness. For example, Jesus looked at him and loved him, the rich young man. He begged to go with him, a man cured of demons. It sounds a bit like the maternal nurture of the Old Testament. And it certainly could be a motive for the witness of the church. Jesus' tenderness. And maternal nurture, as we've said, also entails fierce protection. My mother, our mother, exemplified this. As a therapist, our mother powerfully advocated for survivors of sexual abuse, for example an intransigent, intransigent clergy or school principal didn't know what had happened to them when June Glanville strode into their office. 
The maternal nurturer's witness we should, that would say that one implication is that we should ensure that together women and men nourish cultures that are marked by healthy, safe and life-giving relationships. Well, let's keep, in, keep thinking into this practically and musically. The idea of God's maternal nurture being a motive for the witness of the church. Here's something musical. In jazz, there's this thing called an enclosure and it's part of the, the vocabulary or the signature of modern jazz. So an enclosure means you approach a goal note, but you approach it by enclosing it, giving it a hug. So that's an enclosure. And it's, it's really part of the vocabulary that kind of defines modern jazz or bebop. And then there's this crazy thing in jazz that's an extension of that called a double enclosure, where you hug the note twice. And you're kind of like surrounding it like in concentric circles, but musically. They're double enclosures. It has a real intensity to it because it's kind of like spiraling in on a note. It's a bit like Bach's beautiful, amazing melody. You know, it's a different kind of intensity, but it's, it has that jazz chromaticism. Uh, there's an amazing tune, it's a classic bebop tune, a classic modern jazz tune called Afternoon in Paris that's entirely constructed of double enclosures. So it's just a series of hugs. It's really interesting. It sounds a bit jagged, doesn't sound like the warmest hug, but to, a, to jazz ears, it's nothing but a hug. Have you got the chart to Afternoon in Paris? You know, it's in Cuff for Cat. <laughs> Do you have a look? <laughs> you don't need to know. You just play. You just play four. <laughs> uh, we'll just play the head. Let's play the head twice. Just here. It's just a bunch of hugs. That's all it is. It's just a bunch of hugs. Play the head once. Head once. Head once. One. Mm. Da -da -da. One, two. One, two, three. So it's kind of like this double enclosure that God has enfolded us, that God has hugged us, that God has enfolded us with maternal nurture and that we extend that tenderness, that care, that love, that fierce protection to others as a motif for witness. A wonderful example of maternal nurture in the name of Jesus in Vancouver that was birthed by our previous church is REED. R-E-E-D is the acronym. Resist Exploitation, Embrace Dignity. Birthed by my friend Michelle Miller. And REED supports women in Vancouver who are, trapped in, who are trapped in the sex industry. When Michelle began REED in 2005, there were no human trafficking laws in Canada, actually, and trafficked women had no protection. So the work of REED began with a commitment to provide individual care for exploited women. And as they spent time with these women, Michelle and her team quickly learned that women, women are exploited within systems. The vast industries of internet porn, webcam prostitution, rely upon exploitation and trafficking. And so they got busy in advocacy at the systemic level as well. And they were a part of a chorus of voices that got the laws changed. So Reed's work expanded to interfering with the system, including the work of political advocacy, 
and education. What a beautiful example of maternal nurture in the name of Jesus. Really significant work that Reed does and continues to do in Vancouver. Individual work, work of education, and work pursuing systemic justice. Well, let's go, we're going to play another jazz tune now that has that shape of enfolding. It's called the Night in Tunis Tunisia. And that's the, the arc of the melody. And again, it's that enfolding. It's kind of a big arc. And then it enfolds that goal note. And I chose it because, to me, it has that feeling, that emotion of fierce protection for those it loves.
Well, I wonder what imagination you might have for wit what witnesses' maternal nurture might look like for your community, for your community in your neighborhood. I mean, if maternal nurture is an action of God, then surely that has implications for the life and witness of the church. Am I wrong? Reed's work, Reed's work that I've described in Vancouver is complex, but for you or for your community, maternal nurture as witness may be as simple as an act of kindness. That might be for an individual, but what about a community that's filled with a spirit? A community that's filled with a spirit can do anything. You know, for your church, could this look like some creative and generous offering within your neighborhood? I wonder how your community can improvise on this biblical theme of maternal nurture. Well, I said maternal nurture is all through Scripture, and I don't have time, for example, to discuss the Apostle Paul's use of the maternal metaphor to describe his work of apostleship, though it would be very rich to do so, Galatians 4.19, for example. And we could certainly discuss, we could certainly discuss orthodox iconography where the maternal nurture is prominent. Mary pregnant with the Christ. You've probably seen that icon many times. Mary pregnant with the Christ and Mary signifying the church in whom Christ is formed and the church then offers Christ to the world with the pain and joy of childbearing. Orthodox iconography of Mary pregnant with the Christ is very powerful. Well, we're nearing the end. Got a couple of tunes to play, but we're nearing the end. So just to recap, what I've said in a nutshell is, this point in our cultural story is remarkable. It's in our lifetime that the church is become marginal in society again. We're not at the center, and for the West, that's the first time since the beginning of the fourth century it's in our life. So if we're not reimagining church with the Bible in our hand in our generation, I'm not sure when we're going to have the Bible in our hand and reimagine re church for our cultural moment. It's this generation, I believe, that has that responsibility. How do we hold out the word of life today? Who are we called to do? What are we called to do? Who are we called to be? in our neighborhoods in Western culture. And then in the second half of our night, I've offered maternal nurture as just one biblical motive of thousands, a motive that can get our imagination going for the life and witness of the church. Maternal nurture is just one note with which we can improvise church. There are many notes. Here's another note. I hope that our jazz homily today has demonstrated the importance of beauty, creativity, and aesthetics. That's another note for improvising church. Beauty and the arts is exactly what the church needs. Churches need to excel at creating art, uplifting our artists, and living, living artistically. This is so that our faith in Jesus can shine out in a way that is evocative beyond words. A friend said to me the other day, beauty is an experience of God, a taste of God. We're just going to play a couple of tunes now. Here is a, just a beautiful old jazz standard called A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square. And as we play this tune, I just invite you maybe to engage in a kind of listening prayer and just see what imagination the Spirit births in you.
Thank you. Well, we come to our last tune now. Thanks so much for gathering, hey? It's, uh, many of you, good half of you, I know very well. Some I don't. It's been wonderful to gather. Just grateful to Christ College for putting on such a wonderful night with such a full heart. Christ College has been so generous, right? Let's give it up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks to Nick on Sound, Pete who set up the room, Karen, Ian Smith, our host. Thanks to you all. We're really grateful. And thank you for all coming out because uh, this wouldn't be any fun without you. Uh, Luke Lammel on drums, Pete Kohlhoff on bass. Well, this is a really beautiful old tune for you to continue to imagine and maybe just continue to pray to see if there's an invitation for you this evening coming out of this theme of maternal nurture. Uh, this is a, a really beautiful old song. It's one of your favorites. I hope that uh, we like it.
That was amazing. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. Just a couple of very quick announcements before we finish. Firstly, remember Improvising Church by Mark Glanville is coming out in February next year with IVP Academic, is that right? So we look forward to uh, buying that. Uh, come back. So you can sign my copy, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, you'll notice on your little coffee tables in front of you, there's a bit of a promo for Christ College there. Uh, we have an open night coming up on the 13th of September. Uh, we'll start with dinner at six o'clock. Come and find out about the college. We'd love you to come and join us. We've been talk about, talking about improvising worship. Worship's a big topic of discussion. If you look on the other side of that bit of paper, you'll see that Brian Chappell, who has written an awesome book on Christ-centered worship, is coming to speak here on Saturday, uh, sorry, Friday the 13th of October. It's really aimed at people who lead worship in your church. Can I highly recommend that to you to come along? And then on the Saturday, he's going to be speaking about Grace at Work, which is a book that he's just put out recently on a Christian worldview about what you do between Monday and Friday, about work. Really important topic. Can I encourage you to come along to those. Mark's already thanked them, but can I join Mark again in thanking our amazing admin team here at Christ College. To bring off this event is no small feat. And thank you guys so much. They're out in the kitchen. Just give me a big round of applause to the admin team at Christ College. Thanks, Luke. Luke's travelled all the way from Canberra to be here tonight, so thank you so much, Luke, for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. And Peter told me he had to use Google Maps to get from Annandale to here, but thank you so much, Peter, for being here tonight and for playing the double bass. But it's been great to have Mark here as well, not just tonight, but for the whole week. And Mark's been talking about missional church and I think you're getting a little bit of a taste of what he's been talking about tonight. Mark, when you go back to Canada, please say thank you to Aaron for letting you come for this, this week. But we want to enfold you in Christ College when you go back. Yeah. Okay, so we've got something to enfold you with. Oh, right. um, you can oh, even right. open it now oh, if you want to. No way. That's amazing. We want to enfold you. Actually, it's got a hoodie as well. We want to double enfold oh, right. you. Well, in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'd like you to put it on, please. All right, right. yeah. Okay. Sure. Because we... No, you can leave your shirt on. Please leave your shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. Because, because we believe in Christ for all of life, which includes the arts. Yeah. Come on, put it on and we want to, we're on fashion parade. Yeah, let's do it. And there's a card down there that you threw on the floor. All right. <laughs> please, I hear Canada's oh, yeah. cold. Yeah. Come on, the double enfoldment, right, please, which clues the head. Yeah. yeah, look at this. Well, look at that. Well done. Excellent. So take it back to Canada and, and, <laughs> and uh, remember us as you go. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight. As Mark said, it wouldn't have been a night without you. There's still supper left over. There's still drinks. We'll turn the lights back on, mingle for a while. When I turn the lights off, you'll know what that means. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you again. Thanks again. Thanks to everyone on the team.